What's up, everybody? Happy Saturday night to you. Um, you guys know we're on a we're on a journey, right? I don't know why I'm out of breath right now. I just ran up the stairs in the back. This year. <laughs> oh, we are on a journey, and uh, sometimes you have the question, or I have the question anyway. God, uh, what would you like me to do? Um, just tell me what to do, and I'm going to do it. Right? If God tells us to do something, we're going to do it. Sometimes God doesn't tell us what to do, and it's like, well, if you, if you tell me what to do, then I'm going to do exactly that. Um, but sometimes he doesn't just tell us, he wants us to be with him. Um, has anybody ever read the book Pilgrim's Progress? I haven't read it. I listened to the audio book, so I don't know if that counts. But I got my Audible app, and I, I downloaded my free book, and it was Pilgrim's Progress, and it took me like... 10 hours or something like that, so it was like two weeks driving back and, back and forth from YPG and back, and I finally got to the end of it, and it was so anticlimactic at the end. It was like, and then he reached the celestial city, and the book's over. What? <laughs> oh, it's Pilgrim's Progress. It's all about the journey. Yeah. The whole book was about the journey and about, um, oh, man, what was his name? Somebody help me out. What was, what was his name? Christian. Christian. Yeah, his name was Christian, because the story was about a Christian that was walking with God, and it, it was about the walk. So what I'm talking about tonight is walking with God. So as I was saying, sometimes we wonder what God wants me to do. Tell me what's required, God, and I'll do that. And he says, well, he wants us to be with him. And when we be with him, that's proper English, then he'll show us what to do. Well, just tell me what to do. No, come and be with me, and I'll show you what to do. And that's the, that's the journey that we're on, is that we would walk with God. So it's not about just trying to make it to a destination. Christianity is not just about making it to heaven. We didn't all come together tonight because we're like, man, I hope we can just make it to heaven. But we're together tonight because, hey, we're on this journey, and we want to walk with God. You want to walk with God, I want to walk with God, and we want to help each other walk with God and encourage each other to do that. So what, is, what does the Bible say, Micah 6, 8? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? See, he's going to tell you. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? So to do justly, that means we're going to do what's right. Everybody's trying to do what's right, right? And to love mercy, okay? I like that one. Blessed are the merciful, or yeah, blessed are the merciful because they will be shown mercy. I like mercy. And then he says, and to walk humbly with your God, and that's the, the third and I think the most important point, and that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Is my sermon title up there? Well, I couldn't call it walking with God. That's like, okay, yeah, we all know we're supposed to do that. So, to walk with God requires putting your heart into it. It's not something you can just do or set on autopilot, but you've got to set your heart on it and put your heart into walking with God. We're talking about heart and skill. This is the year of heart and skill, and so to walk humbly with God takes really all of your heart, and it takes a lot of skill to be able to walk with God. It's something that's active. It's not passive. Oh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. And we thank you, God, for the privilege that it is to walk with you. And I pray that tonight as we talk about this, that you would inspire every one of us to walk with you and that we would go out of this place, even if we don't remember anything I said tonight, that each person here would be inspired to walk with you and that they will walk with you all the days of their life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so that verse, uh, Micah, Micah 6, 8 that I read before that, uh, God asked the question, with, or, or uh, it was asked the question of God that the prophet, the prophet Micah wrote, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then it says, but he has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? So it talks about giving an offering. We can give God everything. We're not going to take up another offering. We just took that. And I'm telling you right now, after we take the offering, God's not looking for your money. He doesn't need your money. 
You could give him all the money in the world like this is talking about, should we come with thousands of offerings? But he says, what I want is I want you to do what's right. I want you to love mercy. Uh, Jesus said that, that he uh, loved mercy more than sacrifice. And he says, I want you to come and uh, to walk humbly with your God. So we, we need to give our offerings. It's good. It, it helps us recognize who God is. It helps us recognize that God blessed us. It helps us recognize God's our provider. Um, God uses our money to do things throughout the earth. And so if he can get it to us, he can get it through us, right? And so all these things that it's good to give, but that's not really what God requires of us. What he requires is that we would walk humbly with him. You can give your offering without engaging your heart. You know, at first it's hard. Like you gotta put your heart into it and you're like, man, this is hard and I gotta do this with my heart so I can start tithing. But then you find out Destiny's got a little app and then you can set it on auto pay and then you just kind of budget it. You don't even have to think about it. If you're not thinking about it, your heart doesn't even have to be in it. I don't do that, by the, way, by the way. I go and manually enter in the number every time and hit send on there. I'm not saying it's bad to do it or not. I'm just saying that's how I do it. Um, so we can do the external things, the, the actions, the external actions which we're supposed to do without putting our heart into things. And so think about this. When God asks you to do something, you can do it without putting your heart into it. If God says, I want you to do this, you can say, okay, and you can do it without putting your heart into it. But if you're going to walk with God and you're going to watch him and you're going to walk humbly with him and he's going to show you as you go what to do, you have to put your heart into that because he's not just giving you some kind of order, but he's going with you and he says, I want you to walk with me and we're going to do this together or actually watch what I'm going to do and I'm going to use you to do it with me. Yeah. It's going to require effort, constant effort, a lifetime of effort but it's not without great reward, both in this life and in the life to come. So, this is where my title came from. A lot of people like to cling to the promises where God says he will be with us. You know, and people walk around like, I'm just this rock star, and I'm gonna go do whatever I want, and whatever I feel like, and I'm gonna go live my life, and God promises that he's always gonna be with me. Yes, okay, they cling to those promises. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you, in Psalms, it talked about, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, right? And people cling to those promises, but God says, but I require something of you, that you would be with me. Yeah. It's not just about God coming and being with us, but it's, there's a requirement that we would be with him. So what does this mean? It means God's not your groupie. Yeah, what exactly is a groupie? A person, actually the actual dictionary definition says particularly a woman, who regularly follows a celebrity in the hope of meeting or getting to know them, often used in a derogatory sense to describe an enthusiastic or uncritical follower. So somebody that just blindly follows after somebody, they have no criticisms of their life, but they're just trying to, trying to get to know them and trying to get to meet them. And a lot of people think God's like that. Like God's this uncritical God that just follows me, and I'm this celebrity that God just wishes to meet but he's gonna be with me. Or people say stupid stuff like, oh, don't drive faster than your guardian angel can fly. I put that one to the test. <laughs> All right. So, I have some news for you. God is the star of this show called Your Life. You're not the star. And it's all about what he wants, where he wants you to go, and what he wants done and he's going to do what he does, and we have the privilege of joining him in that work. Right. So it's all about Jesus, and I get to walk with him. I get to walk with the one that it's all about. One of the scariest verses in the Bible, well, to me, one of the scariest ones, Matthew 7, through 24, Jesus said, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and then I will declare to them I never knew I never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness and so there's these people that are on the earth and they're casting out demons in the name of Jesus and they're doing these things for the Lord and they say didn't we didn't we cry out to you didn't we prophesy in your name and then Jesus says well I never even knew you so to walk with God is to be known by God so God knows those who walk with him when we walk with God, we're known by God. So, and then where should we go? The path has been illuminated already through the word of God. Psalm 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. So we don't have to map out the course for ourselves. 
And like I said, we don't know where we're going, but it's going to be lit for us. It's going to be, it's, the word is a lamp for us. So as we start to go, it's a light to your feet, which means as you're walking, the word of God is going to illuminate where your feet are and where God's taking you. You're not going to see it until you get there. Biblical examples of walking with God. In Genesis 5, through 24, it says that Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. We have 70 or 80 years at best. Tomorrow's not even promised to us, but I'm not, I, I guarantee you no one here is going to live 365 years. But it says Enoch walked with God and then he was not, for God took him. So he perfected this art of walking with God, and God's like, I like this guy so much, I'm going to take him. Why did he take him? I don't know. There's a couple theories out there why God, took, why God took Enoch. But he walked with God, and the Bible mentions that, that he walked with, with God, and then God just took him to be with him. Genesis 6, 9, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time, and Noah walked with God. It was notable that these great men of God walked with God. Abraham, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. New Testament, 2 Corinthians 6.16, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols for we are the temple of the living God just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And Revelation 3.4, but you have a few in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. What did Jesus have to say about walking with God? What was that sermon like three weeks ago? What does Jesus say about it? He said it a, a, a little differently, but he's saying the same thing essentially. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So walking with God was displayed in perfection through the life of Jesus when he was here on the earth. Jesus is our perfect example of what it means to walk with God because Jesus, as the Son, was constantly in communion with the Father. So to walk with God is to follow Jesus. As he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. And so to follow Jesus entails those things he was just talking about, denying yourself, taking up your cross, which is being a living sacrifice. In other words, it's not about you. And three is following his lead. Jesus said that he could do nothing except what he saw his father doing, present tense. That Jesus didn't come to earth with all the information that God was going to do downloaded and know exactly what to do all the time, but he was constantly meeting with the father and he says, I can't even do anything when I'm here except what I see the father doing. And so as Jesus would go out and he's doing all these miracles, the only thing he was doing was what he saw God doing at that moment. That's a model for our lives. So what are we going to do while we walk? What are we going to do? John 5, 19, Jesus gave them this answer. Very I truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing of himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the, the father does, the son does also. So God, well, first off, anybody believe God's doing something in your life? Yeah, yeah of course he is. Like, well, of course God's doing something in my life. I'm the star of this show, remember? So of course God's doing something in my life. But God is doing something in the lives of everybody around us. He's doing stuff, and we can't get so focused on what God's doing in our lives that we forget to join him when what he's doing in the people that are all around us, people that don't know him, people that he's trying to bring to himself. So we get to join God in what he's doing in the lives of the people that are around us if we're walking with God. And it's required of every Christian. It is required of every Christian to walk with God. So whether you have a title, whether you've got a ministry, uh, I don't know, whether you're here or somewhere else, it is required of every Christian to walk with God. That's basic Christianity 101, that a Christian would walk with God. It's required. So what we need to be doing is walking with God and helping others to not only join us, but to learn to walk with God themselves. That's discipleship. I'm walking with God. I'm going to take somebody with me and not only let you walk with me as I try to, to walk with God, but I'm going to teach you that you would walk with God for yourself. 
So here's some characteristics of walking with God, my three points. Uh, walking with God is a, or walking humbly with God is a symptom of spiritual health. It is an inward practice, not an outward display. You can't fake this one. You know, people that BS things. I don't want to say the word. You can't BS this one. <laughs> it's, in, it's an inward practice. It's between you and God. Nobody can see this. And third, it is the source of our purpose and our greatest pleasure. So, number one, walking with God is a symptom of spiritual health. When I did my EMT class a few years back, they, they talked about looking for signs and symptoms in your patient. When there's something wrong with somebody, look for the signs and symptoms. So, a sign is something you can see. Like, this person has red skin. It should not be red. Or, this person's covered in sweat, and it's not hot right now. What's going on? These are signs. A symptom, you have to ask them about, because a symptom is something that they feel inside. What are they feeling? Oh, my stomach hurts. You can't see that, but it's a symptom. And so walking with God is a symptom of spiritual health. It's going to be known to you. You're going to be able to see it and judge for your own life. The man who is walking with God is sure of his own salvation. The man who is not walking with God should seriously consider his spiritual health and possibly even his own salvation. Am I saying you have to walk with God to be saved? No. But I'm saying if you're saved... You'll be walking with God. All right, some things to consider. Do you see yourself in your proper place? We're talking about walking humbly with God. Do you recognize your sinful nature, and have you pled guilty before God as a sinner? Have you given Jesus his rightful place as your Savior, who alone saves you completely, or are you still trying to do good enough that you would earn your way into heaven, to put it simply. Is Jesus completely your savior, or does it have to do with something that you would do? Like, oh, I have to walk with God enough, or I have to do enough, or I have to do enough in the ministry. Or is it, is it Jesus alone that saves you? If you are trusting in any of your righteousness, or any of your good works, or anything that you're doing, any of your actions, to get you into heaven, you are prideful. Because you think that you're good enough. You think that your works are good enough. And so we're required to walk humbly with God, which is to say, uh, I need Jesus. I don't have anything to offer of myself. Walking with him uh, humbly, humility is, is a complete dependence on God. Uh, there can also be a tendency to rely on our own experience or the knowledge that we have to try to make up for walking with God. Right? The person that has all the right answers. Like, they know the Bible better than you do. They have all the right answers. Oh, wait, no, I'm talking about us. We have all the right answers, right? But there's no power in their life. Uh, the requirement is to walk humbly with your God. It's not just to walk with God, but to walk humbly with him. And a lack of humility will rob you of your spiritual power. Because the power didn't come from us, the power is from God. And so when we walk humbly with God, we're able to have that power in our lives, spiritual power. Um, who thinks they're humble? No, don't answer that. <laughs> we can't even judge ourselves on this one because the moment we start to think we're humble, it's like, man, I think I'm doing pretty good. I think I'm actually pretty humble. Then we're not humble. If you think you're humble, doesn't that make you not humble? So if you, if you know you're not humble... Does that mean you actually are? <laughs> to truly be humble, we have to become nothing before God. We have to have no, no reliance on ourself. We have to recognize that everything we have comes from God. We're completely dependent on God. As Jesus said, he could do nothing on his own. Jesus came and he walked on the earth and he said, the son can do nothing on his own but only what he sees the father doing. So we can do nothing on our own but only what we see the father doing. So we need to realize that apart from God, we can do nothing. Humility is taking our proper place as an unworthy servant at the feet of Jesus. Like the prodigal son, he came home to his father. And he wasn't like, hey, I'm here, I'm back, I know you needed me. No, the prodigal son came back and he said, uh, make me like one of your hired servants. 
he, he felt like he didn't even have a place there. He just wanted his father to let him back in the house, and he's like, I will, I will be a slave. I'm not going to be anything special. I give up anything. I have nothing to offer you but that you would just let me back into your house. I'll do whatever it takes. That's the same kind of position that we need to come to God with. Not pridefully like, oh, what would God do without me? Well, God better be happy that I came, that I decided to be so committed. Ooh, that's not walking humbly with God. Or then we judge other people. I'm kind of bad at that one. But then again, I don't preach for everybody else. I'm like, well, this is what God's showing me, so maybe it can help you too. But we judge other people, and sometimes we're right in, in judging the acts that someone else has done. We condemn them for the acts, but we forget where would each of us be uh, if it wasn't for the grace of God. Would we have done the exact same thing? Would we be in the exact same position or probably even worse if it wasn't for the grace that God put on our life? But we think it's because we were so good that we're, we're able to judge other people. Stay humble. Stay humble, my friends. And walk humbly with God. If you are well off, have you asked God why you have so much when so many other people go without? Why did God pick you to be the rich one? And if you live in America and you got a job, you're pretty rich. Are you talented? Are you smart? Are you like a smart person? Where much is given, much is required. So if you're smart, if you're talented, don't forget that you have to do more for God than ordinary people. So instead of bragging about how smart you are, maybe you should say, you know what, maybe I'm not that smart. Because I don't think my life looks like the potential that it should be compared to everybody else. We have to recognize that we're debtors to God and that we could never repay him for what he's given us. Walking with God is such an internal thing that oftentimes we overlook it. Like, we want to do it initially. We get saved and we're excited about it. We want to do it, but sometimes we overlook it because we, it's easy to focus on the things that are visible, like things that other people can see, like going to church, going to life group. These are things that are visible. People can see these things. And so we put a lot of emphasis on this, uh, and sometimes we can forget about the internal walk with God. So my second point is that walking with God is an inward practice, not an outward display. Walking with God is not something that we put on display for other people to see. So you have to evaluate yourself. Is your heart currently fixed on God? Are you following God heart, heart and soul? Are you committed to him with everything you are? Does your spirit walk with him or are you at a distance from him? Even though you're sitting in church tonight, are you, are you far away from God? Are you not walking closely with him? And it says walk humbly with your God. Is God your God? Or do you just kind of believe that he exists? You believe that he's good. Like, oh, I believe, I believe in God. I I believe that Jesus died for us, but is he your God? Is he your God that you're walking humbly with? Charles Spurgeon said this, as the fish abides in the ocean and the bird in the air and each calls the sea and the sky its own, so do we dwell in God and he is ours forever and ever. That's what a walk with God is. Like a fish in the ocean or a bird in the sky. Our, our habitat is that we would dwell with God. Yeah. Our walk with God is birthed in our personal, private, devotional life. That's spending time with him personally in prayer and in his word. But to walk implies movement. So we're not talking about just having coffee with God in the morning. But we're talking about you set the tone there and then you continue to walk with him throughout the day, every day. And it's not just visiting him in, in church for an hour or two every weekend or in life group um, for an hour, hour and a half. We're going to be walking with God. So walking is also a normal pace of travel. It's not we got all excited about something and all of a sudden we start sprinting and then we're back to not walking again. But walking is a pace that you keep up for your whole entire life. Walking with God every day, Monday, Tuesday, 
Wednesday, Thursday, and you go to life group, but you're already walking with God. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Sunday afternoon. Number three, walking with God is the source of our purpose and our greatest pleasure. So we all want to fulfill our purpose. We want to have a life that means something. We want purpose in our life. Walking with God is the source of that. And it's the source of our pleasure, the source of our joy. Uh, A couple things that walking with God does. First, it gives us a sense of safety. If you walk humbly with God, you will feel safe. What, What can happen to you if you're walking with God that God doesn't allow, that you're not in God's hands? Uh, so it gives us a sense of safety. It also gives us, uh, it, it gives you a sense of peace. Man, I need some peace in my life, right? So walking with God gives us a sense of peace in our life. Uh, peace in that nothing can be taken away from us since we've already given it over to him. Yeah. Jesus, when, when everybody was leaving him on the earth, um, you know, he had these crowds of people following him and he was doing all this cool stuff and these miracles and there was crowds But there came a day when everybody was leaving. And they're like, yeah, we're not interested in Jesus anymore. And Jesus said to his disciples, he's like, well, are you guys going to leave too? And then they said, oh, this is awesome. They said, we've already given up everything to follow you. They're like, where are we going to (laughs) go? We gave it all up to follow you. So the peace that you have nothing to lose because you've already given up everything everything to God, and anything that you have, you hold with an open hand. We're not clinging on to anything. So we give it up. So God lets us keep some stuff, but we have it with an open hand. And whenever God asks for it, it's like, well, I already gave this up. Even though I, even though I have it, even though I possess it, I've already given this up, and God can take it. What about the one thing, or the, the one thing you lack? If there's, a, if there's a one thing in your life, well, there's this one thing that God can't have, or there's this one thing I wouldn't give up. Guess what Jesus is coming for? Yeah, for real. He's coming for that one thing. So why don't you start with that? Right. It's going to be the hardest thing you ever gave up in your life, but you say, you know what, God? I give this up, and it's yours. I don't know what it is for you. Whatever's the most important thing in your life, you need to give that up. Because yep. otherwise, <laughs> it will be tested in your discipleship, and it's going to come up later. So just know that you're going to have to give up that one thing. And you may even get to keep it after you give it up. Just because you give it up doesn't mean God's not going to let you keep it. I'm making no promises to you. (laughs) But what do you get after you give it up? You get peace in your life. You get peace because you're not holding on to anything. Maybe you'll get it back later. Maybe God will give it back and you're like, oh, that, yeah, that's pretty cool, but I don't care about it like I used to. It's not my idol anymore. It's not my God. You're my God. So thanks that I get this thing back that meant so much to me that that I was willing to give up. It's not going to compete for God's rightful place in your life anymore. And uh, you also get rest. You get rest for your soul. Yeah, you can get rest while you work, too. Jesus said, uh, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. Not rest for your body. Some of us have already had too much rest for our body. (laughs) We need rest for our soul. (laughs) Rest on the inside. And lastly, we take comfort in knowing where we are going. We're walking with God. We know where this is going to end up. Just like I was talking about, I listened, I listened to the audiobook. I didn't read the book. Can't lie and say I read it. Pilgrim's Progress. He was on this journey. He knew where he was going. He knew that it was going to end up at the celestial city, heaven. He knew he was going to end up at heaven. We know we're going to end up at heaven. So it doesn't have to be the only thing that we think about. We can think about, man, I'm going to enjoy this walk with God while I'm here on the earth. I know where I'm going. I don't have to worry about that anymore. That's taken care of. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to fulfill my purpose. As I walk with him, he's going to show me what to do, and we're going to walk together. Man, we're going to do some things for God. 
So as we humbly walk with him here, we know where he's ultimately leading us. So you were created to walk with God. I'm going to end on this. I want everybody to stand up. So recognize that, that you were created to walk with God. And in Genesis 3, we see where man's uh, walk with God was broken because Adam and Eve in the garden were initially designed, God created man, that we would just walk with him and we would be in relationship with him, but that was broken. In uh, Genesis 3, 8, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They're in the Garden of Eden, and God would just walk through the garden. And they heard him coming, but there was something different about this day. They hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. They had never hidden from him before. But the Lord God called to the man, and he said, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. It was because they had allowed sin into their life. They had rebelled against God. And because of that, that perfect walk that they had with God was broken. God was still walking, but they were ashamed and they were hiding. Now in Romans 5, 18 through 19, it says, Just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. One sin separated from their walk with God. One act of Jesus made it so that we could come and and be reunited with him in that walk. For just as through disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Only through Jesus, our perfect walk with God is restored. We find ourselves walking with him where we were always supposed to be. That's what we were created for. And we have the privilege of accompanying him where he goes, being with him and working with him all the days that we walk on this earth. There's no greater purpose than to walk with God and to do his work. That's your purpose. That's been restored by Jesus. And so we'll just close on this and I'm just gonna pray. But Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is to walk with you. And I pray that we would really understand that, God, that we would understand how privileged we are to walk with you and that you would forgive us, Lord, for not taking advantage of that, God, and and walking closer to you and walking every moment with you. And for anyone here that feels like their walk is not as close to God as it should be, anyone that feels distant from you, anyone that wants to walk with you, but they just feel like they're not in step with you, Lord, I pray that you would bring them right there, Lord. And as we learned in the, the story of the prodigal son, that the father was looking for him when he was a long way off. And when we take that one step towards you, when we take that step to start walking towards you, we know, we take comfort, God, that you would run towards us and that we can walk with you. So it may look like you're a far way off, but one step towards God can bring you right back into his purpose and bring you right back into working with him, to walking with him. And so, Lord, I pray for that, and I I pray that we would just take this, God, and, and we would be inspired to walk with you every day and throughout the day, Lord, that we would be people that walk and we see what you're doing and that we would just be able to participate in that with what you're doing and the people around us, Lord. I pray that we would see that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And now if you're here tonight and you've never given your life to Jesus before, I want to give you the opportunity to do that before we close. We talked about sin and the reason... We need to make a decision to come and get right with the Lord is because the Bible talks about the sin that's in our life. In Romans 3.23, it says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that means that you've sinned and I've sinned, and our sin actually separates us from God. Our sin condemns us to be separated from God in a place the Bible calls hell, that we would be condemned to to go there when we die. It says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the way God provided a way for us to come back is he sent his son Jesus to come and walk on the earth. And we were sinful and we were not able to pay the price for our own sins. Our penalty was death. Jesus was innocent and because he was innocent, he was actually able to die in our place. And so he walked on the earth 32, 33 years. He walked on the earth. He was perfect. He was without sin. At the end of his time on earth, he gave himself over to be crucified. So they took him they, they beat him, stripped him of his clothes, and they whipped him till he was nearly dead, bleeding. 
they marched him up to Calvary, put the cross up on his back and marched him up the, up the hill to Calvary and they hung him up there on the cross and they put the crown of thorns on his head and they drove the nails through his hands and his feet and Jesus was hanging up there on the cross paying the price for every sin that you and I have ever committed. He was hanging up there bleeding and dying and it was us who was supposed to be there but he was dying in our place. At the end of six hours, he died there on the cross and they took him off the cross and they buried him into a tomb. But the good news is the story doesn't end there because on the third day, by the power of God, he was raised from the dead. He ascended up into heaven shortly after that and he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In order to receive that, the Bible talks about a few things. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And it also speaks forgiveness as it says that when we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what that's saying is whatever sin was in your life, if you would come and confess that before the Lord and ask for forgiveness, he'll forgive you. You make that confession with your mouth, he's gonna come and be your Lord. If you believe that with your heart that he was raised from the dead, you can receive salvation and you yourself can walk with God from this day forward. So if that's anybody in here before, or if that's anybody in here and you've never prayed that before, I wanna invite you in just a second to raise your hand. But we're gonna pray that. You can get right with the Lord, you can receive forgiveness, and you can start your walk with God tonight. So if that's anybody here, you've never prayed to get saved before, but you want to do it tonight, I want you to raise your hand. I'll even give you a count. One, two, three. Raise your hand if you need to get saved. All right. And uh, maybe you've prayed that before, and you came tonight and you want to rededicate your life. Maybe you've... you've uh, receive salvation but you've since walked away from the Lord and you want to come and rededicate your life if that's you and, and you want to rededicate tonight I want you to raise your hand we'll pray for you any rededication I'll even give you your own count there we go awesome anybody else here you didn't get saved uh you need to get saved, but you didn't raise your hand the first time? All right. Anybody else in that back corner? <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, salvation, rededication, last call. Mm. Okay. Mm. Well, I'm going to keep on going if you're all waiting. Anybody else holding out? Anybody else? Hey, now's the perfect time. I've always, I've always got to give the last call and make sure nobody answers that one. All right, so if you, if you raise your hand because you want to receive salvation or to rededicate, um, I want you to do something bold and just uh, come up here to the front, um, here at, the, uh, at the, the base of the stage here. And uh, you don't have to come alone. You can bring a friend with you. Uh, just whoever we're praying for, stand on the front and friends stand behind. And I'm just going to lead you in a quick prayer. And what we're going to do is we're going to pray that you would receive salvation for your life tonight. So give them a hand as they come down, guys. Okay, so living for Jesus is the best decision that you'll ever make in your life. And uh, tonight's, tonight's a really special night, and, and I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer. And the whole church is going to pray with us. So just pray this and, and pray this believing, and God's going to come and do a work inside of you tonight, okay? So Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I confess that I'm a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to come into my heart to be my Lord and to be my Savior. I love you and I want to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. Amen.